Our first lesson is from the Old Testament, from 2 Kings, chapter 2. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking, and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah, Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 50 responsively. The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the rightness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand in body or spirit for our gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, 
Alleluia. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, as such no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around. They saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace and wonder to each of you this day from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May Jesus Christ be praised. Amen. All right, I have a confession to start with right off the bat. It may surprise you to hear this, but pastors don't know it all. I'm certain that you already knew that. There's training and there's lots of education for pastors, but pastors don't know it all. Sometimes pastors even forget to turn the camera so that people at home can see them. <laughs> Sometimes even the best rabbis in the tradition don't know it all. And the best teachers don't know it all. If you come today looking for knowledge that this pastor has to offer, well, I hope you get some, but we don't know at all. Sometimes the rabbis, rabbis and the teachers do know well that the best answer to a question is another question. The question that prompts deeper thinking or deeper questions. And I'm not entirely sure if Jesus knew it all, honestly. I'm not sure if Jesus in his human flesh knew it all. God in flesh, of course, but human minds can only take in so much. Human minds have their own limits. I'm pretty sure that if Jesus did know it all, <laughs> he wouldn't have shared it all with us. <laughs> because Jesus loved mystery, and Jesus knows that our human minds can only take in so much knowledge and so much understanding. Plus, some things are just that amazing, just that sacred, so holy, or so incredible that it's impossible for us to fully know and fully, completely, and deeply understand. And today's readings are filled with reminders of that. With the exception of the psalm, the readings are very difficult to understand and explain. Their meanings are in their telling. Their effect is the amazement of the events described. The writer of Kings and Mark especially describe events that defy description. Paul's writing to the Corinthians is very much a reminder that Jesus Christ is the key to our understanding. That the light of Christ 
sheds light on all the things that we understand in the Christian church. It is through Jesus that we see all of the events of scripture. Christ sheds light on all things for the Christian church. The story of Elijah's chariot ride into the skies is pretty hard to take in. It's amazing. Unlike anything else, Elisha has probably ever experienced or seen. The story of Christ's transfiguration with Moses and Elijah is unlike anything that these three disciples have ever seen or experienced before. They tell the story, eventually, but in the midst of what was happening, they were pretty clueless. In fact, we read they were terribly frightened. Let me give some real life examples of these kind of things. How, how would you describe in writing or spoken words a fireworks show? How would you describe music you hear to someone perhaps who is deaf? There's a great story around Beethoven. A, blind, or a deaf composer, Beethoven, was, was said to have written his Moonlight Sonata when a deaf friend of his, or a blind friend of his, asked him to describe the moonlight in the sky. So Beethoven, deaf, used music to paint a picture of what that might look like for his blind friend to hear. About 24 years ago, more in my lifetime, the band Pearl Jam released a concert film called Touring Band 2000, and it collects performances from different shows of their concert tour, and during one of those performances, um, the band notices something happening off stage. There's a sign language interpreter trying to pass on to people in the audience who are hard of hearing or deaf what's happening on stage. It was pretty amazing. I don't think the band had seen that before. I haven't seen that at many concerts that I've attended, but the band invited the interpreter to come up on stage, and as she made her sign language, as, as the singer sang, and she danced, and she did everything she could with her body to signal to people who couldn't hear what the music might sound like. That's some examples of how hard it is sometimes to describe events in words, even sign language, or in music. Those are kind of joyful events, but it works on the other end, too. How do witnesses describe the horror of a school shooting or terrible crime scenes? How can words describe the horrific loss of life and land going on right now in Gaza or in Ukraine. Just some examples. We can see images and we can hear stories, but they only capture so much of the reality. Sometimes the best you can do is imagine. Sometimes the best that teachers can do is retell a story and let our imaginations run with and that's the kind of readings we have today. Descriptions of events that lead our imaginations wild. When faith is concerned, those wild imaginations are ripe for faith to grow. We're able to imagine a God who can do more, who is more, who believes more, who cares more, who enlightens more, and who lives more for us than we ever imagined. The pastor and writer Tom Wright used the language of Paul to help us see. He said that there are times when a veil is lifted and we see something that we hadn't seen before. Tom Wright wrote this. It's easy enough to dismiss such an experience as a hallucination albeit a very odd one. Jewish scripture and tradition tell of various events like this, he pointed out, when the veil of ordinariness is drawn back and a fuller reality is disclosed. 
Most of us don't have experiences like this, nor did most of the early Christians, so far as we can tell. But unless we allow skeptics to bully us, we should be free to affirm that this sort of thing has indeed happened to some people, usually completely unexpectedly, and that those people regard it as hugely important and life-changing. Important and life-changing. For the three disciples on the mountain, it was terrifying. Peter, lovely Peter, blurted out the first thing that came to his mind. and He tried to prolong the moment and hook it into an existing framework of his own understanding. He tried to tie what was happening on this mountain that terrified him to something he understood, the Jewish festival of booths, of tents. His odd and somewhat bumbling suggestion that we stay here and make a tent for Jesus and Moses and Elijah kind of missed the point, but it's also affirming that the event was real. I've read scholars who point out that in certain parts of scriptures, uh, of scripture and especially the gospels, um, people do things that are kind of foolish, to sort of show them in a poor light, and they point to those stories as a way of affirming the truth of the story. That if someone were going to make up a story to convince somebody of something, they wouldn't put in those kind of moments. And I wonder if this kind of moment of Peter, our heart breaks as he expresses what he expresses, and it's as Peter's so apt to do. It just sort of misses the tone a bit. But he was trying to understand something that he couldn't make sense of. Jesus has urged his followers in Mark's gospel to see things. Peter especially. He, he, Jesus has restored vision to blind people both before and after this episode on the mountain. And I think that's important. I, I remember, and you might hear this more this year as we look through Mark's gospel, that one of Mark's storytelling techniques is to put a story within a story. And here the transfiguration story is placed between healing stories where Jesus restores sight. Christ's transfiguration invites us to look at Jesus not just the way that the disciples see him, but also the way that God sees him. Seeing Jesus is important to this story of the transfiguration. Jesus has led his followers up a mountain to see a new view of God's kingdom. In an extraordinary way, they see a bit of what God is up to. They might look, but never ever see. But Jesus has given them a way to see him differently, and perhaps even as the Lord God sees Jesus. We hear the voice again from the clouds, like at baptism, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. In glory, certainly, but also in the flesh. Jesus, the man they followed, the man they ate with, and lived with and walked with, they saw him perhaps the way that God the Father saw him. Jesus was completing in their very midst the work of the greatest prophets of old. Both Moses and Elijah are prophets who had disappeared from view rather than died in ordinary way. And then they reappeared with Jesus. And the ordinariness was drawn back for a moment. Jesus was with them, shining with an amazingly brilliant light. It was, it was like too much to see, almost. But there he was. You couldn't miss it. Sometimes when we look at things bright, like the sun or a bright light, we're blinded. We have to turn away or shield our eyes. 
here is an example of seeing something but not exactly seeing it for how brightly Jesus shined. Tom Wright says that people are fuzzy about what this transfiguration has meant. Some say that it's a revelation of Christ's divinity. I see that. There's an element of glory and wonder and awe in this event. But Wright disagrees. Moses and Elijah aren't divine at all, he points out. If anything, this vision might reveal Jesus glorified in his humanity. A humanity shared with the great prophets, shared with the disciples, shared with us too. Jesus appears to be caught up, lifted up, or raised up, if you will, into a reality that transforms him. His whole being is caught up in the light of God's kingdom, God's life and economy among the people of God. He's not just talking about a new way of life, of God, this new life, but he's showing what that new life is for all to see. Of course, the three don't really get it, not yet. Jesus asks them, orders them, not to talk about what they had seen until a later time, until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then, only after Christ is raised from the dead and the tomb is empty, will they be able to tell this story. At that time, the veil between life and death will be lifted, raised up. That veil between the world that we don't see will be raised up and we will see more see differently, see through the viewpoint of God's self. This story and so much of the gospel only takes on meaning, only becomes clearer, only shines more brightly in the reality of Christ's own resurrection. It's amazing how much light shines from a dark, empty tomb. When we see it, when the veil is raised, as the Lord is raised, and as we are raised too. But what do pastors know? <laughs> you get to see it for yourself. Imagine it for you and your dear ones. You get to hear the stories and let the light of those stories shine into you until you see the light brighter until you embrace the light tighter, until you are drawn into that light in amazing ways, and that light enfolds you. Welcome to Christ. Welcome to life in Christ. I can't really explain it. I can't pass on some secret knowledge to you. There is no secret knowledge to be had, but a pastor like me, or any follower of Jesus, really, can tell the story, can try to describe the life of God with clarity, can show that life to others. Often we do it without words. This is my son the beloved. Listen to him. That's what the voice of God said. It can be as simple as listening. Listening to stories, some of which we can't completely understand, but that make us think, that draw us into something deeper. Listening to the experiences of others in ways that we can't relate to, but make us consider something more listening to voices that draw us in to something greater than ourselves, more loving than we could ever be, more gracious than we will ever know, more living than we might ever consider, 
And more? Well, just more. More than we could ever see.